everybody. I'm just popping in here to give a trigger warning. During this video, I will be talking about sensitive subjects, which include murder, rape, and self-harm. So in today's video, I will be discussing true crime. I have recently fallen in love with the Wine and Crime podcast, so I decided to do this video in kind of their style, except I am not drinking wine. I actually have right in front of me a Blue Lobster Rocket cooler. It was the last cooler in my fridge for my girls weekend. And for the purpose of this video, I am over the age of 19. 19 is the legal drinking age in Canada. I am 20, so it's all legal here. Oh my god, so much sugar. Ooh, ooh, so sugary. Also worth mentioning, I got all this information off of Murderpedia, which will be linked down below. And on Murderpedia, they have linked down below two articles of local journals. So I have based most of my research and information I am giving today from those two local journals. So today we are talking about a Canadian serial killer. His name is John Martin Crawford, and he is also known as the Lady Killer. Crawford was imprisoned for the murder of three Indigenous women. So his murdering spree was between 1981 and 1992. He did these murders in Alberta, Canada, and Saskatchewan, Canada. So in the first article, we're talking about Special Agent Robert Ressler, who has identified specific characteristics in serial sex murderers, which would include Crawford. Over 90% of them are white male. Their families often have criminal, psychiatric, and alcoholic history. History. They're commonly abused psychologically, sexually, and physically as children. It can sometimes be strangers, it can sometimes be friends, but it is mostly family. Most of them have spent time in an institution as children. And there is very early onset um, mental problems. And they also have a high rate of suicide attempts. He also said that they usually have a high IQ, which wasn't the case for Crawford. Virtually everything that journalists know or even the public knows about John Crawford is from the court records. He never spoke publicly, him or his mother. During the whole trial, Crawford did not utter a word, which made the judge feel as though he did not show any remorse. An average Joe like me and hopefully you <laughs> would feel some type of remorse for the family. You took somebody's, potentially their mother, you took somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, somebody's friend. During Crawford's killing spree, he killed three indigenous women and beforehand he was trialed for manslaughter. A weird fact about him that I found during my research was that Crawford was baptized Catholic and raised in the Catholic religion, but he told the psychiatrist in prison that he never felt um, truly at peace in his religion, and the only way he felt um, any type of spiritual connection was when he was praying to the indigenous god. I don't know the meaning behind this or why he felt like that, but I find it weird that he committed three of his murders against indigenous women, yet he prays to their god, and that's the only time that he truly felt a spiritual connection to a god. I don't know, it's a little strange. He did start also sniffing glue at a very young age and then progressively got into worse drugs. And when he got released from the first time he was in prison for manslaughter, he drank very, very heavily. It was often said that it was normal for him to drink a 24 case of beer and a 26 ounce of hard liquor a day. In an interview in 1998, Crawford actually admitted to a doctor that he started hearing voices at around the age of 16. They were just voices until one day he actually saw two women who were green and had no clothing on from the waist up and he figured out that those are the voices. They would often tell him things as little as get dressed or don't go on a date with that girl, she's not pretty, but they also told him, kill that person, they're annoying you. This doctor did research to find out if the murders had anything to do with these voices in his head, but he proved that it was not the case. Also worth mentioning, John said that these voices were from UFOs and other planets, so that's interesting. <laughs> So there is a couple of serial killers who are very well known in Canada, which would include Paul Bernardo, Carla Kamolka, and Robert Willie Picton, which is the pig farmer. Um, Crawford did not get as much media attention, which I will be discussing at the end of the video, but his crimes on these women were just as horrible as the other ones. I know, like, I feel like Robert Willie picked in should be like in a whole different category like he shouldn't even be with these people because 
whew. But um, they are comparing them in the article and they're saying that obviously Crawford's crimes were just as horrible. So now we are going to stop talking about Crawford and we are going to talk about Mary Jane Sterloin, which was the first woman that he murdered. It was in 1981 and it happened in Alberta. They met at a bar and they actually found her body on Christmas Day. When she was found, her breasts were mutilated with bite marks. He was originally charged for first degree murder, but he pled guilty to manslaughter, which when I first read that, I was like, what the heck? It um, infuriated me. It made me so mad because with manslaughter, he got 10 years in prison. But with first degree murder, he would have got 25 to life. So instead of potentially having this crazy murderer, in prison for life. You only got him in for 10 years and then you put him back in the public to do damage. I think that when a man mutilates a woman's breasts, he deserves more than 10 years in prison. If I was her family or her friend, I would have been fuming at that. Or even somebody in the community because this crazy man is going to be released in 10 years to the public because the judge agreed to give him manslaughter. He didn't end up staying in Alberta after being released from prison. He moved to Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan with his mother. After being released from prison in December 1990, he was fined $250 for trying to hire a prostitute, which ended up being an undercover cop. During those drinking binges that I mentioned a while ago, he would often go downtown in Saskatchewan and try to find prostitutes. So by 1992, Crawford was sniffing glue and shooting drugs on the daily. May 9th, 1993, Janet Sylvester went to police and told them that Crawford had tried to rape her. They found Crawford practically dead on the beach from substance abuse and a sunstroke. They held him in remand and then in June, his mother ended up putting up the bail to get him released into her custody. Obviously, mommy to the rescue! <laughs> Later that same year, him and a fellow inmate, Bill Corcoran, ended up picking up 16-year-old Shelly Nipope. So they raped and beat her and then Corcoran dragged her to a bush and ended up stabbing her to death. So now he ditched Bill. He's like, I'm gonna do this stuff on my own. He's like, I don't need Bill, I don't need that. So October 20th, Crawford raped, strangled, and tortured Ava Tazup. He sawed off Tazup's arms before burying her body, but showed no remorse during the trials. Just have to mention that again. No remorse during the trials. He literally sawed off her arms. Not only sawed off her arms, he raped her, he beat her, he tortured her, sawed off her arms, and then buried her. The next day, Kalinda Waterhen ended up with the same fate, except he let her keep her limbs. So sweet of you, Crawford, to not saw off her arms and then bury her. He decided just to bury her after raping, torturing, and killing her. So in October 1992, Crawford took part in a beating of a Saskatchewan man. Never mind, it wasn't just a beating. They ended up killing him. So most of 1992, 1993-ish, he spent in prison. So after he was released for the beating of that man in 1994, there was a hiker who was hiking, obviously, and he discovered two bodies in the woods and Crawford, not long after, became a suspect and the police kept their eye on him. So the police watched him for four months, right? Right, okay, good for them, right? But during the time that they were watching him, he picked up a woman named Teresa Kamatsi. He brutally beat and raped her. He didn't kill her. See, he's getting more generous. Didn't cut off the limbs, and now didn't kill her. Thank you, Crawford. Hats off to you. So Crawford decided to dump Teresa on the streets and the police picked her up and, to make this story even better, the police arrested her. Teresa. They arrested Teresa who was raped and beat by Crawford who's already a suspect in two murders and she's probably like yo this dude you know right? No they arrested her. You want to know why they arrested her? Because she's a prostitute. Even if you are a sex worker 
you do not deserve to get sexually assaulted, beaten, killed, catcalled. You don't deserve any of that. Also worth mentioning, I don't know if Teresa could be like, oh, this dude sexually assaulted me. Like, I don't know if she knew who he was, but the police were supposedly watching him. But even if she couldn't say who it was, she did not deserve to be arrested. And that's not my opinion. That's the way it should be. Okay, fellas? Okay. So Janet, the woman who is previously raped, she was murdered in 1994. They can't prove it was him, but they have suspicions that it was him, right? With reason. So in January 1995, the police were finally like, yeah, we'll take Crawford in. Really? Because the woman that he raped and who said he raped her is now dead. They found two bodies. They've been watching him for months. He raped Teresa. Guys, come on. Finally, in May 1996, Crawford was convicted of the three murders of the indigenous women in Saskatchewan, but they suspect that he did murder more women. Shirley Lump Thunder and Cynthia Baldhead are the two women that they suspect he also murdered, but they were never able to prove. So now that we've talked about everything, let's kind of get into everything. <laughs> So there was a book published on his murder spree, which I find super interesting. And it's called Just Another Indian. I'll put a picture of it right here. And it is named that because it is assumed that his case and his murders did not get as much media attention because his victims are indigenous women. Honestly, that's the reason why I wanted to do this case was because he targeted indigenous women and they got no media coverage which is ridiculous. Indigenous men, women, children, the whole indigenous community and culture is treated so poorly in Canada even though we stole their land. So the reason that people think it didn't get as much coverage is first of all because his victims were indigenous women. Second of all, his murdering spree entered the same timeline as Paul Bernardo's and Paul Bernardo killed young white women. Just gonna say right here, before anybody gets mad, Paul Bernardo's victims deserved all the media coverage they got. They deserved the country mourning for them, but so did Crawford's victims. It just all comes back to racism and it's infuriating. And how I'm gonna end this rant right quick is that Canadians often like to say we're better than the United States. We don't have, we have less crime, less, discrimination, blah, 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 blah. But we don't. <laughs> we have indigenous women and children going missing quite often if you keep up with the news. Um, yet nobody's doing anything. Because why? I'm waiting for you to answer. <laughs> because, because they're indigenous? Because they're less than us? Sorry, not us. They're less than white people. <laughs> I'm just, I'm laughing because it's ridiculous. The mindset of um, some people. This can't continue to happen. Because if it was a white 15 year old going missing, the whole country would be sharing that Facebook post that says missing with their all their information and their name. Everybody would be sharing it. Everybody. So in conclusion, Crawford is sentenced to three life sentences. So he will be in prison for the rest of his life. Even if only one person watches this video and I educated one person on this case and the discrimination that still happens in Canada and potentially made them want to become an advocate, made them want to fight for justice, then I did my job as a an advocate for the indigenous community, for Black Lives Matter, for the LGBTQ plus community, for every minority. Comment down below if you guys want me to do more true crime videos, please, because I honestly love them, but like, I'm not gonna do them if nobody else, eh, no, I probably will. <laughs> I probably will. So even though this was quite a heavy case, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Have a great day. Go be an advocate for the minorities, please. It is so, so, so important. See you next time. Oh, also, I... I finished it. <laughs> Have a great day. See you guys.